Ready with shelter. That's the name, that's the name. You gotta remember. I hope you enjoy this video. Like, subscribe, it's ready with shelter. Doctor slash nurses. What was the most how the FCK are you not dead patient you dealt with? We were the closest hospital, so they brought a civilian in former F medic. His safety gear failed, and this guy fell 128 feet from a communications tower. It had rained the night before, and he fell into a marshy puddle of high grass. Flat on his back. Concussion and whiplash. No broken bones, but the bruises that covered his body from head to heel were something to behold. He spent a week in the hospital before he could move comfortably. He was doing 60 miles per hour when he landed. Wow. Ems told us he left a deep impression in the mud. His whole body had mud covering him. So I'm thinking of Roadrunner now. A friend of mine was feeling crappy for days. He'd go to work. Feel exhausted. Come home. Sleep 13 hours. Repeat. Finally he got to feeling so bad he decided to go to the ER. He drove himself. Around 3 a.m. He got out of the car and the security guard said oh my god, and ran to get him a wheelchair. Er admission said oh my god, and got the er document. Er doc noted my friend was quite yellow. They ordered blood work. When it came back the er doc didn't believe it, and had it done again. When the second round came back the doc asked my friend for next of kin information. My friend said you can't call my mom. It's 4 a.m. and the doc said your kidneys have completely failed. We are going to send you upstairs and give you a pint of blood and an hour of dialysis and we need to know who to call if you still don't make it. You should have been dead a month ago. He got a kidney from his sister and is still doing well today. Apparently the kidney was as close a match as one can get and he should live an essentially normal lifespan. Some people just don't die right. Like, death is afraid to touch them. I have a friend who literally fell down from the top of a hill. It was more than a 100 foot fall. Landed on rocks. At the age of 12 or 13, or probably even younger. He's still fine today. He used to stammer ever since he started talking, but after the fall, his speech turned out fine. As his parents say, it's because the docs did some surgery near his neck as it was badly hurt from the fall, and that might have set his speech right. He had hurt his head badly too. Such things will make people usually go brain dead. But nothing as such seen in this guy. Great fellow. As a lab tech. I had one I dubbed everything guy. He was complaining of a sore stomach after coming home from overseas. So got the usual what were you doing? Questions. He was in West Africa. Didn't bother to get anti-malarials. No vaccines. Admitted to eating bush meat. Also said he thought it was undercooked. Drank water from a local source. Turns out this was directly from a river. Without filtering it. River was apparently badly polluted. Hired prostitutes while there. Didn't use protection. He basically saw everything you shouldn't do on holiday and used it as a checklist. Borderline case of three stooges syndrome. I had a patient that was already blind from diabetes. Lost some toes. Part of a foot. I check the blood sugar and it's 45 this is Canada, so your normal range is 4 to 7. Check it again. 45. This patient had no symptoms of hyperglycemia. He just took his insulin pen, cranked it, and self-injected home care. Had to wait around a bit to see what would happen, but eventually we left. He ended up being totally fine. Most home glucometers don't go past 30. I was with my trainer nurse who was dumbfounded. I remember when I was a kid, my dad went to the hospital slash clinic small town. So it's both for a checkup, and had mentioned he was drinking about 8-12 L water a day. Doc tests his blood sugar. Tests it again. Looks at my dad, and goes you should not have been able to walk in here on your own two feet, because his blood sugar level was like, 35. And that's how he found out about the diabetes. I had a patient I just delivered. We pushed for 4 hours, before ending up in a c-section. We get back to the room, and I push down on her belly to check the bleeding. It was a little excessive, so I call the document. He came in, 
Minimal bleeding. Because that's how it goes. The blood pressure goes off. It's in the 60s. I do another fundal, and had just non-stop tennis ball size clots coming out. Luckily the doc was at the nurse's station and someone showed him the blood pressure. He comes into the room as I'm doing the fundal and immediately calls a massive transfusion protocol. We end up in the, or giving her so much blood. He placed a tamponade balloon. And we go to Paku to finish the recovery. It's just me, and one other nurse. Everything is going well for a bit. But then there's more bleeding than normal in the drainage bag. Her lips are blue. Face is super white. And the blood pressure read in the 50s. The doc sends his resident to check it out who says it's fine and to give more blood. I ended up calling the anesthesiologist and asking him to come assess. He was known for being rude. But he came in there and immediately called the ob and yelled at him to get in there immediately. I had a lot of respect for him after that. And was really grateful he hadn't blown me off. I still don't know why he didn't blow me off when I called him. We end up back in, or and she ends up needing an emergency hysterectomy. The doc described her uterus as being a paper bag. I came from my coup step down, and was used to patients that looked like crap. But I really thought this lady was going to code and die. It ended up she lost like 3L of blood, was intubated, and an IQ for a few days. I never went to go see her again, because I was so mortified by what had happened. I was newer to labor at the time, and kept feeling like I made a mistake somewhere. Kudos for advocating for the patient, and requesting the anesthesiologist. You may feel like you made a mistake, but all I see here is someone who advocated for their patient, and got her the proper treatment. Just think, what would have happened if you hadn't said anything to anyone? We had a guy who'd lovingly crafted his own gladius sword, and thrown himself on it piercing the sternum and his heart. But he was alive and conscious, and every time his heart beat the handle of the sword vibrated. I'm sorry. Hello. He blacksmithed a sword specifically for his own suicide? Yup. While you were working on your mental health, I was studying the blade. Further proof that men will rather learn a speep ton about the Roman Empire than go to therapy. I'm not a doctor or nurse. But the doctor who saw my mom said he had no idea how she was alive. Years ago, my mom was having gastrointestinal problems. She had incessant stomach aches and was bound up something awful. After three days of not being able to poop, she went to the doctor to get checked out. After a thorough examination, the doctor determined that her gallbladder needed to be removed immediately. The next day, after the surgery, my mom comes to and sees the doctor standing over. And he wasn't happy. Your gallbladder was dead. He said. Like. Dead dead. In fact. It was completely gangrenous. Had you waited another day to see me. You old died. Had it ruptured during surgery. You old died. That was the worst. Most stress inducing surgery I ever had to perform in my 20 year career. No offense. But I hope I never see you again. And he walked out of the room. This sounds like my uncle. Almost exactly the same thing happened with him. He had peritonitis from the whole ordeal. Just wild. Not a person. But when I was a kid our cat went out with four legs then just strolled back home. Not showing any signs of anything being wrong. With three. No blood. Emergency vet didn't believe my mother when she called. But agreed to see her anyway. Surgery the next day, to do whatever to stitch the hole. She lived happily as a three-legged cat after that. I think it's a primal thing. Kinda like shock but different. I seen a crocodile get its whole leg ripped off in a death toll by another croc, and it didn't even mind. Didn't move or bleed just kinda carried on with his day. Crocodile be like RFCK. I can't believe you've done this. The CPR algorithm changed about a decade ago from ABC airway, breathing and circulation to cab circulation, airway, breathing. This means that instead of opening the airway slash giving rescue breaths first, we began doing compressions first. The first time I used the new version was at a witness to rest. I happened to be at the bedside when the rhythm changed and was therefore able to start treatment immediately. The patient became unresponsive, pulseless and the rhythm showed ventricular tachycardia. 
I began chest compressions and the patient raised their arms and tried to fight me. Confused. I paused and checked a rhythm slash pulses slash assessed their alertness. The rhythm was indeed pulseless ventricular tachycardia and they immediately rolled their eyes back and went limp. I must have gotten on the chest so quickly that they hadn't had time to lose brain perfusion. It's never happened since. Your compressions were good then. I was always warned that it might happen. Yeah. I did not receive that warning haha. I briefly thought I'd misread the situation and just absolutely destroyed someone's ribcage for no reason whatsoever. Then they flopped back down, and I was like, oh right, still dead. Back to work. 18 years ago I went into the air to get a cyst lanced open. 3 weeks later I felt pain in my back. I went back to the air, and they found nothing. Only did raise. I felt weak leaving so went home, and crashed on my couch. I woke hours later, and tried to get up and fell. I went down fast. I called an ambulance, and went to the hospital. I sat for 6 hours until finally someone came to check me out. I had a 105. Zero fever. They immediately rushed me into a MRI and lo, and behold I have MRSA inside my spine. I was rushed into surgery and now live from a wheelchair. T5 to T11 infused. The doctor said, if I waited one more day I wouldn't be here. I did 16 weeks of vancomycin through 4th. 3 hours twice a day. I'm truly lucky to be alive today. Oh yeah you waiting was the problem. Not the 6 hours they made you wait. Slash. S. I can't imagine how scary that was for you. You should come in hours ago. I did. Had a patient with an internal temp of 75F. He was drowsy, but fully alert and oriented. He was found in a river embankment in the middle of winter. He had been lying there overnight, before he was found by a dog walker. We didn't believe the equipment, when it told us 75 degrees. So we repeated with a rectal thermometer, then a different rectal thermometer, and then a rectal probe attached to the bedside and medi-therm system. They were all consistent, and after several hours of heating measures we got their internal temp up to 90 degrees, before they went to IQ. The second how the FCKRU not dead patient was a person who had a blood sugar of 1, 800. They weren't in a coma. Just a woman who walked in, to complain about abdominal pain. You're not dead, until you are warm and dead in any cases of hypothermia. We once received a patient that was bitten by a rattlesnake twice. He only managed to get to the emergency ward 3 hours after being bitten. Then to make things worst, we only managed to get the correct antibonum flown in 1 hour after his arrival. He now works at our hospital as an admin clerk and is healthy as ever. There was a guy I looked after who'd thrown himself in front of a train in a suicide attempt. The train pretty much cut him in half. It was bad, and he was not happy to have survived. I'm still not clear how he did. I work with a man who threw himself in front of a train too. His body is covered in the scars of the surgeries it took to save his life. He does not seem like a happy man at all. It's like he's just floating through life waiting for it to be over. Some days I want to just hug and tell him he is loved, but that would be inappropriate on many levels. He probably wasn't happy before he did it, since he tried to kill himself and all. Could you imagine taking such a drastic measure to finally end your life and surviving? That's what keeps a lot of people from even trying. At least for me. I've tried before, and failed and your life usually gets worse after that failure. Surviving in an existence where you are constantly physically suffering when you wanted to be dead to begin with sounds torturous. During my M rotation. Guy had a road accident. Flesh wounds as deep as his intestines were out. Around 40% of his face was scrapped off. One eye was out of the socket. The right forearm had ripped off muscles and you could see the bone. Now the miracle is that the bleeding somehow had stopped. And when I came in, I saw his chest moving and him holding his intestines. I was like, yeah wow this guy is alive. We helped him. Stitched everything back. The face was reconstructed, and now he is alive and well. Tis but a scratch undefined. I think this one qualifies as a flesh wound. My ex-boyfriend is a ski instructor. 
He told me that one day, all the slopes were extremely icy and many people were coming in with injuries. He had fallen badly and returned to the ski lodge. He was checked out and said he felt fine. Fortunately, a paramedic happened to be looking at him when his helmet swung open on the side because it was very badly cracked. They took a 9 year old girl with a broken femur off a stretcher and put him on it and took him to the hospital immediately where they found he had broken his neck and needed immediate surgery. Amazingly, he is mostly fine, except for now having acid reflux for some reason. I've heard stories like this where helmet on alive. Remove helmet death. I'm glad he lived, though. My friend snowboarded to the bottom of the mountain on two broken ankles. Didn't even realize until she tried to remove her boots. Ski injures are weird. By a medical engineer here. That's because at that point, while the bone is broken, the pressure from the boot is holding it together. Once that pressure is released, the bone can breathe and allows the bone to displace and pain to flow undefined. Is this why I can walk on concrete 12 hours a day in work boots, but my feet only hurt once I get home and take them off? Get some good insoles. Seriously. It's the difference between my f peeping knees are killing me and my legs are tired from running around all day. My mom was a critical care nurse and said the freakiest thing she ever went through was having a 15 minute conversation with a little old lady who had no pulse. As I recall, said little old lady past mid sentence. Just stopped. Death came knocking and she said, I'll be a minute. Just wrapping up a conversation with this nurse. There is no force on this earth, or beyond it, that can stop a little old church lady from finishing her conversation before she's ready. We had a patient come in, after mowing the lawn. Patient said something was kicked up by the lawn mower, and hit him in the head. Didn't think much of it. Finished cutting the grass. Still had a headache a few hours later so came to the ur. We cat scanned his head and there is an entire nail embedded in his brain. He had the tiniest abrasion to his forehead, and no neuro deficits. He had no idea. Everyone was absolutely dumbfounded. Good thing you didn't take an MRI. What was the treatment like? Neurosurgeon took him to the or to remove it. He was discharged a few days later, and was totally fine. The patient was awesome. He had the best attitude and outlook considering it was such a freak accident and so stressful. I'll never forget him. I can't imagine coming in like hey I think I might have a mild concussion. Actually so you have a nail embedded in your brain. No speep. A nail? Bro for real? Lem see. Nad but my potassium dropped to 1. 2 which is very critically low. I was 19 and drove myself to the air and my complaint was that my chest felt funny. Doctor called for a psych consult for my anxiety, but ran blood work in the meantime. I knew the second the blood work came back, and was red, because my room was swarmed. Spend the next 8 days in the IQ. That funny feeling in the chest is really something else. I'm not sure if our funny feelings were exactly the same, but I still remember mine a decade and a half later. I was elementary school age. Just farting around on our home computer, when my chest started to feel weird. I described it as a funny feeling. And like butterlies were swirling around in my chest. And to this day I can't come up with any better of a description. The only thing I'd add, now that I've got a better vocabulary is, that it came alongside this sudden, overwhelming dread. I had no idea what was wrong. But I knew, that something was very, very wrong. I remember my parents taking turns checking my pulse on my wrist, followed by my dad putting his ear to my chest. When my dad lifted his head, he looked terrified. They both thought they must have been feeling their own pulse alongside mine, and that's when he realized they hadn't been. When we got to the ER, one of the nurses checked my pulse with his hand as they wheeled me over I was not allowed to walk, or wheel myself, which I remember being quite indignant about to the vitals machine in the waiting room. The first test registered at a completely normal, 90 something BPM, but the nurse was insistent that was wrong, and brought someone else over. The second test registered a BPM of at least 210. I hadn't done anything physically intensive for hours at that point. Initially, 
After several EKGs and a heart monitor I was diagnosed with supraventricular tachycardia undefined. It turns out I had hypothyroidism and was quite possibly dangerously close to a thyroid storm. My thyroid hormone levels were so elevated they couldn't calculate it exactly and just put a plus on the end of a number. Since I know people like resolution to a story like this, I'll just summarize briefly. I've no longer got a thyroid that's trying to kill me. I had mine ablated and now take thyroid hormone supplements. I actually got it ablated twice. My thyroid actually not only survived the first ablation, but continued to be hyperactive. Which in my understanding, isn't all that common. I consider that med student, to have saved my life. He is the reason, that any time a doctor asks, if I'd be comfortable having a med student sit in on our appointment, I almost always say yes. While a student did a clinical placement at a major trauma hospital, where they kept a collection of x-rays you never usually see, because the injury would typically kill the patient instantly. Most interesting one was a smashed pelvis from a jockey in a horse racing accident. That kind of injury would usually also result in rupture of femoral arteries which means you bleed to death very quickly. But somehow this guy survived, and made it to hospital, and lived long enough to get sprayed. Don't know if he recovered though. Not a provider, but used to work in the air. Hard to narrow it down to one, but one morning a guy drove up to the doors, pushed his dead girlfriend out of the passenger door onto the sidewalk, and drove away bad heroin that he had given her. Two hours later, she was awake and whining for that same boyfriend. The nurse angrily explained the situation to her and said, you were dead because of him. She said, man, ain't my first time. Narcan is something else. The other would have to be the 13 year old caught in a gang related shooting. Her entire torso was covered in bullet holes. Several in her throat. She was raggedly breathing through several of the holes. A month later she walked out of the hospital. I live in a bad area and I carry Narcan. I was just wondering how far gone someone can be before it's not useful anymore. This is good to know. She was blue and no heartbeat. I watched a nurse climb on the gurney, straddling the patient to do chest compressions, and they just ran the whole thing down the hall. I used to work in obstetrics and the preemie ward. I've seen some extremely premature babies that looked like they were barely hanging on. Tiny head maybe 2 inches from chin to top of the cranium. Purplish slash reddish translucent skin that looks paper thin. Eyes closed. Not responsive. Limb smaller than a finger and always extremely skinny. They often face lifelong problems due to being born so premature. I remember once asking the doctor why we even bother at that stage, since it looks so hopeless, and in some cases, it's, frankly, she said. And I remember very well the preemies that were hopeless cases 20 years ago now live normal lives. So that is why we keep on pushing. My oldest was a macro preemie. Eyes were still fused closed when she was born. The doctor was right. She is 13 now with no health issues and is smart as a whip. Power to you however for working in that depth. I bet it was very hard. One of my little cousins was a healthy 2 pounds when he was born. I visited them at the hospital and when they offered to let me hold him, I was like hell no I'll break that kid. He's a perfectly normal teenager these days. Not a doctor, but I was at a fencing meet, when my instructor forgot to step aside, and the sword went through his mask, through his mouth, and out the back of his head. Missed anything important, and he was perfectly fine, other than having a sword through his head. My late grandpa was in the army, told me of a time in Vietnam or Algeria where one of his buddies got shot in the head by a sniper. It was a small caliber and the bullet apparently went between the hemispheres of his brain. He kept fighting for a while. I like to imagine the sniper freaking the peep out seeing that. Man that million dollar wound. I work in the public health field. And I've had a few patients to track down. That I honestly had no idea how they survived. One had a laundry list of issues. Hep A. B. C. Endocarditis. Mitral valve messed up. AIDS. Abscesses. Disseminated MRSA in their bloodstream. I was required to gown up. 
mask, gloves, whole nine yards, just to be in the room with them. And I quickly found out they were in no state to answer questions I had. I find out later they were transferred for open heart surgery to a different hospital after no lie attempting to check out against medical advice Amma. At hospital too. They have completed surgery. And finally are somewhat on the mend. Their parents checked them out. Again Amma. To make the multi hour drive back home. I was flabbergasted and sure. No way they'll even make it home. And lo and behold. They crop up again in a public health investigation. A year later. Alive. I was shocked they had survived that long. I had a hemorrhage I didn't know about. I had seen some blood. While wiping that was a bit more than I chalked up to wiping too hard. Went to a physician and he checked my anus. And told me I had hematoids. That I had probably agitated. Recommended I use baby wipes and preparation H. Well. Two days later. I had started feeling very nauseous with a nasty headache. I slept right up until it was time to go to work and so decided I shouldn't call off. About 5 hours into my shift, I go to take my break and use the restroom. The moment I pushed, I passed out and fell off the toilet to be found by my coworker however much later. EMTs are loading me up and start taking my vitals. My O2 levels are low F and when we got to the hospital, they rushed me through the back and into a room. They say I need blood pronto, and I remember passing out again. The next thing I woke up to was an RN throwing my curtain open and shouting, Why the f-peep isn't he hooked up yet? Apparently the ball was dropped somewhere between getting my blood type and the blood dropped off. So I sat there for over 45 minutes needing blood, and that RN was madder than hell. Finally get hooked up, and I took 3 pints of blood, stayed overnight and needed another pint by the next afternoon. Imahij was found, microsurgery performed and I've been fine ever since. The same RN came to see me after my surgery and told me she was terrified I was going to die when the EMTs handed over my vitals when dropped off. That RN is dope as heck. Glad you made it out alright. Case 2. My best case ever. A young woman. In her 30s had a stroke. She clotted off the basilar artery, the big artery in the base of the brain that supplies all of the primitive functions, like breathing and awareness. I found out about her a day after the event. This, by the book, is a hopeless case. She was literally already dead. But, because she was young, they prevailed upon me to do something. I poked a catheter a long skinny plastic tube into her groin artery then snaked it up to the blocked artery in the base of her brain. I infused a clot busting drug into the artery for about 12 hours TPA. I rechecked, and the clot was gone. She woke up the next day. After a month, she literally walked out of the hospital. She sent me a nice card a month or so later. It bothered me that her handwriting was better than mine, even after her stroke, but I was pretty happy. It's not your fault. Doctor handwriting is always terrible. EMR cured that problem. Now all we have deal with is those 17 page notes to say a patient had a cold. Not as bad as most of what's here, but I'm a sleep tech, and I had a middle aged patient whose oxygen fell all the way down to the 40s, and was having central apnees for over a minute he spent more time not breathing while asleep. No wonder he complains he feels dead every single day. I couldn't believe it. So I tried a bunch of other arc scimitars and different hands slash fingers and they were all incredibly low while he was asleep. Not me, but my mom was a nurse right after college. A family got in a car crash and there weren't any serious injuries. They were just taken to the air to be assessed. They had a baby and my mom was asking them questions about its health, etc. When she asked what the baby was being fed, the mom said juice. Just juice. She had heard that at 6 months, you can start feeding the baby juice. Not realizing it was juice, in addition to baby food or milk. This woman had been feeding her baby only juice for months undefined. When I was put on lithium they warned me that it can f-peep with your sodium levels. So I was googling info about hyponatremia. I read a case study in a medical journal about a baby in Canada, whose parents had been adding sugar to his formula to help him recover from a flu. 
he started refusing to drink his milk and got more and more sick. So they resorted to force feeding him this sugary milk to try and strengthen him. Eventually he became completely unresponsive and was rushed to the ER. After tests, the doctors found he had insanely high sodium levels and the parents realized that the sugar they'd been adding to his milk had actually been salt and they'd nearly killed him by force feeding him this disgusting salty mixture. I can't imagine how awful they felt after this realization. I can't remember how they treated it. Just that he almost died several times and had kidney damage was in a coma for a while. They weren't sure if he'd recover with brain function intact etc. But he did pull through and there was a follow up from a few years later when he was starting kindergarten. He was developmentally a little bit behind other kids his age but they didn't know if that was related to the hyponatremia or just coincidental. And other than that he was completely healthy and normal. Reading stuff like that really makes me wish I could have been a doctor. It must feel so good to pull someone back from near death like that. Not a nurse but this is a cool story. My dad has a blood condition that makes him prone to clotting and it has sent him to hospital several times now. The most recent case was this. He had started doing nightly runs, raising money for a charity, and every time he came home, he'd be more and more puffed out with a really sore leg. He mostly just thought it was muscle cramping until at one point my mum just told him to check it out in the doctor. Doctor almost immediately told him to go to hospital as soon as he described it. Hospital took him in. Sent him for an MRI I think. And in the nurse's words, they stated it was the largest blood clot they ever saw in a person that was still breathing. So that was a fun week. I'm not even a doctor and when I read the symptoms, my brain was all like ding ding thrombosis red flag damn hope your dad's doing well also i hope username doesn't check out lol did you know that part of the natural instinct to hold a stillborn child to your chest is that there is a very unlikely chance of baby waking up i was at a press conference years ago about the only kid in decades that lived through it like pronounced dead and started breathing in mum's arms it's pretty common for premiers to be given to the mother to hold foreclosure and whatnot and mum gets told they might spasm a little it's just nature there's a reflex for babies to do it to seize and grab for air and parents can mistake it as a sign of life yeah little lazarus that's his actual name managed to use this stupid evolutionary development to live he was legit declared dead and still lived i'm not dead starts breathing again absolute mad lad Back in my surgical days, resident on my trauma rotation. Really nice young guy comes in via M's. He'd been working on a factory site doing work high up on a tower, think 80, 100 foot kind of deal. Was climbing his way down, about halfway, when he hears commotion overhead and someone shouting watch out. He's on the ladder so can't do too much, but bows his head to cover it. Feels something strike the back of his neck. Manages to stay calm. Reaches around and realizes a large piece of metal is embedded in him. His medic training kicks in. He calmly climbs down the rest of the ladder. Sits down and asks someone to call an ambulance. Wish I could upload the photos I have. It's a wrench 36 cm slash 14 inches long. But the non-wrench end is a pointed pickaxe type tool. And that's what's embedded in him. Nestled nicely against C3 slash C4 middle of the neck. All we can get is rays. Too much metal artifact for a decent court. Can't see any fractures. Fully intact neuro exam. Rockstar of a spinal surgeon just decides to yeet it out. Few stitches. Soft collar for a week and guys back to normal. Yeet in. Yeet out. Seems logical. Cardiovascular tech here. I was doubling as a special procedures tech in radiology when a healthy young man 20s who was visiting a friend collapsed in our CCU. He had lost femoral pulses and overall was suddenly very critically ill. We were asked to do an autic angiogram to define his anatomy and all arterial access was occluded. We finally got a catheter in his left axillary artery and managed to get a picture of his total autic dissection that began at his autic valve. Spiraled down and occluded his right renal and most of his iliac arteries to the femorals. We did what we could to stabilize him and sent him to Houston where he was grafted and he lived. 
I saw him maybe two years later, when he was back at our shop for a checkup. He was scarred from his neck to his knees. A lot of plastic in there. You guessed had an unsuspected Marfan syndrome, and a damn near killed him. I never saw anything else close to that much vascular trauma that survived. I wasn't all that aware of Marfan syndrome back then and now every time I see long skinny digits I remember that guy. Just saying literally nobody in this thread guessed that from your story. 23 yo female came in with sepsis after a kidney transplant on the black market. She had been on the transplant list, but had not yet received a match. So I guess her parent decided to take her fate into their own hands out of desperate on. Parents wouldn't tell us where they had been to acquire it. But the patient was septic with a strain of bacteria called New Delhi Metallo Beta Lactamase and DM which, as you can probably guess from the name, was first identified in the Indian subcontinent. This kind of bacteria produces carbapenemase, an enzyme that digests a wide range of lactam antibiotics, including carbapenems, which are basically our last resort of antibiotics for the treatment of infections caused by resistant strains of bacteria. So the patient was being pumped full of our best antibiotics and this bacteria was simply digesting them. Patient then got a secondary pseudomonas infection in both their eyeballs and had to have them removed. Pseudomonas is a nasty bacteria and one you don't want in your eyes. Google back quote pseudomonas keratitis at your own peril. They did sadly die in the end. Not a nurse or document. But had a doctor say this exact thing to me. 18 just received delivery on a new motorcycle, rolled out of the dealership. A B-double driver had fallen asleep and drove through the highway barrier into the service road which I was on, and then into me. I saw it coming and braced. Somehow survived. About a month later I took delivery on my second road motorcycle, to promptly get rear-ended at a red light, but a drunk driver. Then at the end of the year. I got into an ab ceiling accident where a poorly anchored sling had dislodged and added additional rope to the line and jarred my back. Got the hospital. Same doctor again. He straight up said how the f peep aren't you dead and why are you back? Did you at least get a punch card or something to ward a free surgery? I've told this story before. Youngish female. Early 20s maybe. Around 400 lbs. High speed mvc. Her car was torn in two, and she was ejected around 100 foot. Landed against a telephone pole. When the cops show up they assume she's dead. Nope. Just drunk. Her massive body fat had protected her from pretty much any injury. I think she broke a few bones but was fine. Also saw an older guy, maybe 60s who was having headaches. Went to his PCP who got an outpatient court scan. He then went out dancing with his wife. Gets a call from the doctor to go the er. Uh, guy had a massive sidereal with shift. Like his entire brain was smooshed to one side of his skull. Went to surgery that night. Wife goes that's why he was such a bad dancer tonight. Patient on hospice. Advanced cancer. Limbs literally rotting off. Lasted that way two weeks. It shouldn't have been possible. It should not have had to happen that way either. Horrible memory. Dealt with something similar years ago, gangrene from diabetic complications on a woman. She had already had one leg amputated for the same issue, and was then apparently considered too high risk for a second amputation. It was a death sentence for her. I remember other cowalkers making morbid jokes. About when her toes would fall off and which one. The worst part was towards the end she wasn't really with it anymore. Totally liquid diet and liquid meds I think liquid oxy just as needed in those cheek swabs to keep her hydrated eyes. Her family came to visit, and you could see she wasn't really responsive anymore, so they just settle in, and start bitching about how bad she reeks. Like, I can't imagine those being my final moments. My family members showing up to sit around, and complain about me dying with too much odor as my body rots around me. Holy speep. Was it the worst smell I've ever dealt with? Yes. Did I feel the need to non-stop whine about it? No. It wouldn't have changed anything for the better. It would have cost those people absolutely nothing to have stayed quiet, and yet they still chose to be like that. I'm not a nurse. But I did work as a stock tech in the critical care, or at the hospital I work at for a while a few years back. I heard the call come in. 
and all of the staff rushed to prepare a room for an incoming patient. When they came in off of the elevator to the life flight landing pad, I saw this kid probably 16 ish get wheeled in with paramedics completely surrounding his head in particular. I figured he just had some sort of severe laceration they were trying to keep from bleeding, as there was a lot of blood. They took him into a room, and I followed with a feeder cart. That's when I saw his head, or more accurately, what little was left of it. Basically the entire front half of his head was completely missing. Eyes, nose, jaw, tongue, forehead, everything. The nurses around his head were desperately trying to hold his brain in while he was intubated. Apparently he had attempted suicide via shotgun to the chin. The worst part was, he was still alive. He was groaning, gargling, wiggling his hands and feet, and it seemed he was still very much aware of what was going on. I had to move on to other areas of the unit, so I'm not 100% sure what happened after that, but I seriously doubt he survived much longer after that. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like. Poor kid. Why would you even try to save someone at that point? I agree that it is awful, but what is his quality of life going to be? No eyes. No mouth. No face. No real way for him to express himself. Can't eat. Can't drink. And he's only 16. Wouldn't it be better to make him comfortable, so he doesn't have to suffer any longer? I agree. Unfortunately. That's not a decision medical staff get to make. As far as I'm aware, unless there's a legal guardian around to sign a DNR, or the patient themselves signs a DNR, anything and everything that could save that person's life should be done. I've seen a lot of peeped up people suffer an agonizing existence because their families refuse to let go, or there was nobody around who could make that decision. Fence post through the head. From the left side of the cheek slash mandible. Crossing the mouth. Penetrating the right posterior cranial fossa. I wasn't on night shift when he came in. But the next morning, I heard the story of how he had to intubate it through his nose using fiber optic guidance. I was impressed when I saw the court head. My dad told me about the time he had a call for a wreck in which there were four passengers alone with the driver. Everyone dead except for the child in the car seat in the back with their scalp, peeled all the way off. Either they or the paramedics flipped it back the correct way and it suctioned to where it was supposed to be. So there's that. Not me. My wife works in radiology. A guy came into the air and was looking a little. Pale. He was coughing a bunch as well. Doc sent him stat for a chest's ray. Note that this guy was mid 40s and appeared in pretty good health. As my wife was scanning him, he started to look a bit more blue in his hands. She kept asking if he was okay, and he assured her he was fine with perfectly normal responses. She was the only person in the room with him at the time. He stopped coughing and seemed alright. The second he was done with his scan he thanked her for taking care of him, and he was ready to go home. She was looking at the scan with a holy speep face, because his lungs were completely clotted up. Of course as a tech, she can't say speep to the patient. She had that how are you alive? Thought. He dropped to the ground, and started spitting blood. My wife immediately hid code blue and emergency staff rushed in, before she had to try to administer first aid herself. He was instantly dead. Pulmonary embolisms that just dropped him right there. Edit TL. Doctor scanned him, and had a rather pleasant interaction. My wife is thinking oh no. This isn't good. Then the guy codes. That was a bad day for all involved. Edit 2. My wife is willing to answer questions. This happened about 10 years ago. At the time it was pretty traumatic. Pulmonary embolisms are no joke. I experienced chest pain for months. Along with a bunch of other symptoms. One night I couldn't breathe. My heartbeat was irregular and pulse was very slow. I was going to drive myself to emergency, but my legs were very weak, so I called an ambulance. The paramedic told me I was having an anxiety attack, and reassured me I didn't have to go to the hospital. I insisted they take me there. I wasn't tended to for a very long time in the air until my machine started going off like crazy, and I was drifting in and out of consciousness. A nurse who wasn't my nurse checked in on me and screamed whose patient is this? 
They ran a D-dimmer test which came back positive. So I got x-rays done on my lungs. I had two massive pulmonary embolisms in my right lung and my doctor said that I would have died in my sleep that night. Not a doctor or nurse here. I'm a lab tech. But when I worked at a hospital in Connecticut we had a patient come in complaining of weakness and dizziness. The nurses told us later. We ran a test called a CBC as the doctor ordered. The hemoglobin was 2. 8. The patient should have been passed out hard. But no. I was told she walked in on her own. Undefined. To further the story. In doing the CBC our machine wouldn't calculate the hemoglobin. Because it was so low. We had to use our blood gas analyzer to get a result. It was that low. That's crazy. Mine went as low as 3. I went to the doctor thinking I had vertigo and asthma. I was fine. Working running a bar. Just a bit out of breath and dizzy. <sighs> Worked an IQ. Admitted a guy with dizziness. Hooked him up to our monitors, and it was plainly obvious he was in VFib. A lethal rhythm. Normally people are non-responsive when they get to that stage of heart disease. And soon dead. He was awake. Alert. And oriented. He looked at the monitor and said. That doesn't look good does it? Am I going to die? The attending internal medicine doctor replied. Actually yes. He then passed out and died. We attempted everything possible to revive him. But to no avail. Still. How did he manage to maintain consciousness in VFib? I had extensive osteomyelitis in my foot from an infection the year before. I had done 89 days of outpatient 4th and commissin for a MRSA then, and I was in heavy denial that the infection had returned. Due to the dead bone I had been told when the infection returned. Not if. I was sleeping about 20 hours a day and could barely function. Finally, after my wife threatened to divorce me if I didn't act, I went back to the outpatient clinic to go back on 4th meds. I rode there on my motorcycle, in the rain no less and go through the air to get back into the outpatient program. The first thing they note is my pulse oximeter readings are 68. They usually start freaking out at anything under 90. Next, my blood pressure crashes to 78 over 42. I'm rushed by ambulance to a major hospital and found to be septic and in early stage organ failure. I vaguely remember an nurse who was very nice to me, but it was mostly a blur. Two weeks later they amputate my right leg. A couple of days later a nurse comes to visit me to tell me I was the politest corpse who ever passed through her emergency room. And she was happy to see me on the road to recovery. Undefined. The pulse ox and BP stats are correct. Not typus. The outpatient clinic told me I had set some kind of unenviable record. Not only for being upright and conscious, but also in a rain suit having arrived on a motorcycle. Apparently. Your body can adapt to these extremes, if the downward spiral is gradual. Mine was over about 4 months. If you took an otherwise healthy person, and applied those numbers to him all at once, they would pass out or die immediately. The human body's ability to adapt is amazing. But make no mistake, I was a walking corpse. I ended up with a BKA. Baloney amputation. I use a prosthetic limb. I walk without aids. My left foot got f peeped up too. With charcoal foot, and I wear a brace on it daily. But I both drive, and ride without vehicle modifications. I own and run a successful business. I go to the doctor regularly, and I listen to my wife. A friend of mine went through a similar thing. He got a wound, that just wouldn't close. He'd been cleaning and bandaging it on his own. But it got infected. Soon he was sleeping way more than normal. Confused. He would fall asleep mid-sentence talking about one thing, and then wake up talking about something else entirely, etc. I finally convinced him to go to the ER. They admitted him immediately saying he was maybe a few days from dying due to sepsis. And he spent 45 days in the hospital on large doses of the serious, industrial strength antibiotics. Oh 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 I have one. I'm not a doctor or a RN, but I I work in healthcare. I take ultrasound pictures of people's hearts. I put my probe down on a middle aged lady in the air. I thought my machine was on frozen and went to unfreeze the picture. Turns out her heart was barely beating and it looked like it wasn't moving. She had walked off the street and felt out of breath. 
a normal heart ejection fraction how well it's squeezing is 55% and up. Hers was about 2% if that. Because it was barely beating, and blood wasn't moving around the blood started to clot together. It made a huge clot. It was an easy 6cm x 5cm. For reference a female heart is considered to be dilated at 5. 3 centimeters. So the clot inside the heart was bigger than a dilated heart. It was bad. I honestly have no idea how she was able to walk around at that point. TL slash DR drug abuser allowed his heart to beat too fast. Over and over again. For months. Just to get forth drugs before defibrillation to slow it down. Bought himself a pacemaker. Womp womp. The long version. Somewhere between 2001 to 2004, we had a patient who had a chronic PSVT fast heart rhythm who would eventually go into VT fast, irregular, unstable heart rhythm that will kill you, and need shock to get back to a functional rhythm. He was basically coding while awake, and needed defibrillated, or he would die within a minute or two. Chemical conversion fourth heart stopping slash restarting medication didn't work on him. For some reason. He required defibrillation. VT is an ineffectual heart rhythm. It is not conducive to life. PSVT and SVT are like their precursors. Or predictors. So to speak. Your heart can only do PSVT slash SVT for so long till it's like Spongebob and says alright. I'm out with a last little run of VT. Then you dead. Edited to say death would be from cardiac arrest. Not a heart attack. Technically. But cease of function arrest. Trying to keep this in layman's terms. But not saying cardiac arrest unintentionally makes the cause of death unclear. Defibrillation hurts. If you are conscious. It is not a good time. We sedate you with benzos like Verst. Before we shock you because of this. This guy was also a drug abuser. He would stop taking the meds. That kept his heart rhythm regulated different than chemical conversion. More like chemical maintenance or prevention from going into the fast rhythm, just so he could come into the air, where we didn't have time to debate whether we should give him benzos or not. We had to defibrillate him, and soon, or he'd go into VT and be dead. I think the first three or four times, he got versed. After that, the doctors figured out his game, and shocked him without it. He played around with his own heart, just to get a buzz, and he did it so many times. He really should have been dead. I don't know how exactly he was timing it to be in the air uh, when he needed to be, or maybe he was just walking around in PSVT all the time, without actually going into VT. But it just seemed like he should have been dead so many times. He did it so much in like the span of a couple months, they ended up putting a pacemaker in him. The oral medications he took slowed his heart rate down effectively, or maintained a regular, Effective heart rate slash beat once he was defibrillated. A pacemaker wouldn't have been required if he would have just continued taking the medications. But they put a pacemaker in him so that he couldn't manipulate his heart rhythm in an effort to get forth drugs anymore. Add to that the fact that any time we defibrillate, there's a small chance your heart won't start back up. Defibrillation isn't like a jump start. It's like getting hit by lightning. We really are interrupting the electrical conduction in your heart, so that it resets itself. Dude was playing Russian roulette with his life, and any of those times, it could have killed him. Just for a single dose of fourth first. There was patient who went to cardiac arrest on the hottest summer days, after rodding on cocaine. He was found unresponsive for god knows how long and a bystander started CPR. When the medics came they did CPR for 29 minutes. And at the 30 minute mark they found a pulse. He was taken to her then transferred to the IQ. Once the patient stabilized the patient transferred to our unit. He was a complete vegetable. The family did not want to pull the plug. He was unresponsive for a total of 8 weeks then one day he woke up. And we found him on the floor trying to crawl out of his room. He pulled out his trash. Lines. Etc. He was so confused. And it was so difficult to redirect him. At the time it was pretty evident he suffered severe brain damage. Five weeks later the patient is discharged from the hospital. Mindful intact. Passed all of cognition testing. Etc. The patient told us all the events prior to his heart attack. He said he received a second chance and he wasn't going to f peep up this time. 
I'll never forget that patient. I had a hospice patient live 12 days without food or water. She was 90 years old, and eventually lost ability to swallow. The only water she got, was during mouth care. Moistening her tongue, gums and cheeks for comfort. 12 days. Former LTC worker. The mystery was always how, do these old ladies eat almost nothing, and not die? Well, when the pandemic hit it became really obvious shortly after their families could no longer visit. The families were the only ones with the time to sit, and feed them bite by bite. I fortunately left the field before the pandemic hit, so I didn't have to witness it first and. But my ex-colleagues all have PTSD slash hyperballoon defined. Not a nurse, yet but I'm a nursing student and a nursing assistant at a hospital. We had a patient who came in with a blood clot in her leg from overdosing on heroin, and passing out slash overdosing in a position where her leg was pinched beneath her. She was presumably found after almost two days, somehow still breathing. The clot in her leg formed while it was pinned awkwardly beneath her. This patient was with us for almost six months. Normally patients are there for about a week, give or take a few days. During the six month stay, she was losing weight drastically as she refused to eat. Her hair was matted and had to be cut off after many attempts to comb out the matting. She was probably 5 feet 6 and was now down to 90 pounds. She refused to participate in her physical therapy almost every day. She just didn't want to get better, but was also very manipulative with the clinical staff only wanting pain medications but refusing to even have her vitals taken physical therapy pushed every day and some days were successful in getting her out of bed. After she was strong enough to walk with a walker, and the blood clot had been treated, she was discharged to a shelter downtown. Within 24 hours she went to the air at another hospital, and they sent her back to us. There she stayed another 8 months, with her same old ways, refusing care, and not eating. By the time she finally died, she was 68 pounds, and had basically starved herself to death. She refused feeding tubes. Basically any help the clinician suggested she denied. I don't think she would have even lived that long, if it weren't for the fourth fluids. She was seen by a psychologist many many times, and would refuse their help as well. She looked like death from the moment she came in. I just couldn't believe she was a resident at our hospital for over a year, before she finally passed away. Edited to add a detail I missed. Probably the craziest patient I had was during residency. Took a call about a patient with a gunshot, wound to the center of his forehead. But they said he was talking, and just complaining of a headache. M said it was witnessed by bystanders and the guy had been shot by a handgun from a range of about 10 feet. Guy shows up. Has a crater in his forehead. Exit wound in the back. And this weird ridge that's really tender over his scalp. But otherwise he's fine and just says he saw. Turns out on his court scan the bullet tumbled, and basically followed the contour of his skull, and it was all superficial. It's a weird feeling to discharge someone from the emergency department who was shot in the head. Another one. Severely disabled dude. At least two legs amputated, and possibly one or two arms as well. Intellectually disabled. Riddled with kidney stones. I have never seen that amount of kidney stones before or after. Poor guy. At least two legs amputated. It's it possible to have more than two legs amputated? I mean if you saw a guy with his legs amputated, there's no way of knowing how many he used to have right. I have a few that stick out in my mind aside from hospice patients who have hung on for a surprisingly long amount of time. First was a patient in third degree heart block with a pulse of 30 at best. Sitting up and talking like nothing was wrong. I was a new nurse at the time and that freaked me out. Basically the electrical system in the heart was malfunctioning and this person was flirting with a massive cardiac event. Then a lady with a hemoglobin of 4. It should be at minimum 12. She was white of that. The bed sheets. It was really unsettling to see a living human that color. Finally I had an alcoholic patient. Blood alcohol of. For something and they were conscious. They drank a handle of whiskey a day. I was concerned. Impressed and surprised at the same time. 
had a buddy in the military blower. 376, and was still supposed to be drinking, so he got punished. Only went to rehab cause it took time off his punishment. Came back and told me he didn't need it, and it was a waste of time. Military kicked him out, so we will see how it goes. I checked into rehab at. 45 was awake and conscious. Confused but conscious. Kid came in for vague abdominal pain. Long story short she'd been hit by a stray bullet a day or two prior which had nicked her aorta which was still actively bleeding. Eat her another one. Guy woke up with chest pain. Didn't want to bother his wife. Drove himself to the hospital while having a massive heart attack. Collapsed pulseless entridge. He was somehow totally fine after CPR and appropriate medical intervention of course. We had a patient. An 18 year girl. Who was in a bad car accident. She was literally split from chest to pubis by the accident. Somehow, we stitched her back together, though we thought infection would likely claim her. Nope. After months, with lots of antibiotics, she walked, and I do mean walked, out of the hospital. I was in a car crash going down a hill, and lost control at roughly 75 miles per hour. Two paramedics who picked, came to me were having arguments over how to treat me. One thought there was no way I didn't have some form of spinal or head injury and the other thought I was fine. The one didn't want to say the words exactly, but the sentiment he should be dead was there. Did you have a spinal slash head injury though? Only injury was a burn from airbags. My arrival at hospital was met with a big crew who also were confused. I had a homeless gentleman that drunkenly fell off the bridge he lived under. It was approximately a 30 foot drop. He landed close enough to his tent that he decided to sleep it off. He came into us with spinal precautions, but no actual broken bones AOX4 wanting a turkey sandwich. In the medical field, a Randox 4, a slash OX4 or AOX4 means the patient is alert and oriented to person, place, time, situation. My cousin who's a doctor in our country told us about a freak accident involving a pregnant patient. She was rushed to their hospital because her belly was pierced by a falling steel rod from the top of a construction site while she's riding a motorcycle with her husband at a normal driving speed. Brought to the hospital with the rod still pierced through her. They had to saw the rod out and deliver the baby immediately after. Luckily, no vital organs were damaged and the baby was on the right position inside the mom's belly at the right time. Survived and was delivered safely. Iku. Part was heavily sedated. But I like to think he had his moments of deeper sleep. His heart rate would drop into the 20s once in a while and make the telemetry sound. I wanted to change the alarm parameters so badly. Anyway, he lived. Had an Iku patient getting eye fluids with such a low red blood cell count that you could see her blood didn't look very red. I work in substance abuse. I have clients that have overdosed multiple times. Sometimes the overdoses are only a day or two apart from their last overdose. So just to reiterate these are people literally actually dying or on the brink of dying sometimes multiple times in a week. And a lot of them stay kicking. Eventually it gets them if they don't stop. I've lost many great patients. Not a doctor, but my dad works at the hospital and told me a story that happened years ago. My aunt was hospitalized at the time on the fourth floor and this dude comes running into her room and jumps through the thick glass window and landing on the ground. He broke both arms and legs, but survived. I wonder if he landed on all fours, somehow protecting his head from serious damage. NP idea how he wouldn't be crippled or suffer a serious spine injury though. When my father went septic, he couldn't get up. Called his cousin who called an ambulance. They pull up, load him in, and before they leave, they stop. His blood pressure is 60 over 40. They debate taking a medevac helicopter. My father calmly tells them the air is less than 10 minutes away, and it will be at least 15 to get the chopper to him. They quietly nod and drive him out. Eight days later, he was discharged. Two foot wounds cause the sepsis. Not a doctor but a logger. 
seen a guy walk a quarter mile to the landing holding what was left of his arm in his other hand. So much blood splashing out. That the next day Ray Charles could have trailed him. He lived. And they reattached his arm. After they put 9 pints in him during the surgery. Donate blood is the moral of this miracle. When I was 30 I survived 2 episodes of ventricular fibrillation. Before they figured out what was happening. And put a defibrillator in my chest. When they put the ECG on me after the first episode they thought the machine was broken. Because my heartbeat was so irregular. The second episode was caught on an implanted monitor. The next day, when they downloaded and read the results the technician thought his machine was broken. Then his face froze and he said. Don't worry. Everything is fine. As he ran out of the room to get the cardiologist. I yelled back that it seemed like everything was not fine. I had a defibrillator implanted about an hour later. I've had three ablations since then and so far I'm still here. Edited for spelling, and they were V-fib. The first time I witnessed a pulseless attach patient. VTACH ventricular tachycardia. One of the worst things your heart can experience he probably did have a pulse, and was just super weak, but we couldn't feel one. The guy was awake with no complaints other than being cold. He was pale as I've ever seen a human. And he was that way for 2 hours, before we got a cardiologist in. We cardioverted him a few times similar to using a defibrillator, but has some specific criteria. Even though we couldn't feel a pulse, he was awake. So we followed modified advanced cardiac life support protocols, but didn't want to sedate him too much with that even because, well, it's better if he didn't go to sleep lol. We all hovered around his room awaiting for him to pass out finally, so we could start CPR. But nope, he just kinda hung out. Watching Wheel of Fortune wait until literally drop dead. Edited to use more layman's explanations for our non-medical friends were re interested in the story. Did he make it? Yep. The story gets more infuriating, because I had a suggestion, but it was ignored. Cardiologist said HM that's a good idea let's try it, and sure enough he was fixed right up. This is my dad's story of when he got elbow surgery. He woke up in the middle, and started a conversation with the surgeon. He asked if he could see it. Thank you so much for watching. Reddit with Shelter, Reddit with Shelter. If you like this video, subscribe, leave.